um, our next speaker is um, Professor Catherine Bennett. Um, she's the inaugural chair in epidemiology at Deakin University and was head of the School of Health and Social Development from 2010 to 2019. Catherine is head of Deakin Epidemiology, a research unit within the Determinants of Health group in the Institute for Health Transformation at Deakin. She's part of the government's COVID review. And um, Catherine is um, what I would call um, a, a rock star academic, um, a celebrity <laughs> epidemiologist who many of you are probably familiar with sitting in that position with the, the vase of flowers and the, and the, the lovely sideboard <laughs> in, in, her, in her house for all those months and years of lockdown. So um, thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Carolyn. It is a bit odd standing up as an epidemiologist. <laughs> Uh, talking about work I have completed with our um, historians and I must say I was really excited when Carolyn came to me about the idea of this project back in 2019 when we were looking at the possibility of getting some joint science social science funding within the university and um, as Carolyn said I sit within the Institute of Health Transformation and one of our major um, drivers for what we do is around health equity and appreciating the role Medicare plays in that space. So I was I was drawn into this. Um, and I do want to acknowledge my this isn't working. Um, I want to also acknowledge my uh, the other collaborators. So alongside Carolyn, um, David and Kat also were part of this pilot survey project. So we got COVIDed <laughs> in the process. Um, and that actually slowed down this project and delayed the actual survey, which I'm going to talk about today. But it's actually situated at then in quite an interesting time, as the minister alluded to, just post uh, opening up our international borders and COVID in the community. Um, but just before the biggest impacts of the, um, the impact on people's finances in the current cost of living crisis. So that's the work. This will be my transitions. Yeah. Okay, so as background, we um, had quite, I can't actually read the slides. Sorry, I'll go with it. Um, we, we knew a, a fair bit about utilization of uh, Medicare, obviously, through the, the data coming in. And there was also quite a lot of survey work that had been done looking at user satisfaction going back, you know, over the years 83, 91 with um, the and a survey and so on. Um, but there wasn't a lot that really drilled down more deeply into some of the things that were coming up in the conversation we just had with the minister. So this project, the broader project this is part of, had more ambitious aims to explore Medicare um, attitudes as well as opinions about the cultural meaning of Medicare, to examine the various uh, dimensions of public knowledge, behaviour and perceptions, about the services offered by Medicare, as well as that personal connection that the general public might have with the Medicare system that provides that public health care in Australia. And we wanted to enhance our understanding of the links between service access and efficacy and people's um, attitudes. So all in all, to increase our understanding of how people's attitudes to Medicare affected their use of services and vice versa. So in this pilot survey, which sits within that broader project, our focus was um, trying to gather that information through an anonymous online survey, purpose built. So we um, developed a survey tool that was um, quite lengthy, it was 54 items long. We came up with, we sat around trying to come up with the right questions, it's really difficult to come up with a new tool. Um, but we also wanted to include questions that were part of these other surveys as well, so we could link across. And we had a, a wonderful group of um, family, friends and colleagues who helped pilot that survey. And I want to acknowledge their work in this as well. It took about 10 to 15 minutes for people to complete online. It was um, one of those uh, conditionally constructed surveys so that you had skips if you didn't you know, access a certain service, you skipped over, but on average, it took about 10 to 15 minutes to disseminate, we went out through social media channels, but we also went to community groups. This is a pilot. We weren't trying to get a representative sample of the whole population, but we did want to cover the key groups in the population. So people who were 
um, Australian born, people overseas born, and um, covering across the country and um, living circumstances. So eligible participants were basically anyone who was over 18 years of age, um, particularly people who had access to Medicare. We kept the survey open for three months when we um, finally rolled it out. That was February to April 2022. We did have an incentive, it was to go into a draw for um, some gift cards. So the results, we had 200 respondents overall participate in the survey. And as I said, all states and territories um, we hoped would be included, they're actually all represented. Small numbers from NT and ACT, but basically all states covered. And this gives you the profile um, <laughs> by gender. And so um, you can see these are just raw numbers that I'm presenting. We have more females and males, about 60% of the sample were female. We had a couple of people who didn't identify um, as male or female, um, and one who declined. Males tended to be younger um, than females overall, but we again had most age groups um, covered at least. Um, so 85. <laughs> 85% um, were Australian residents and um, I think it makes 56 and yeah, anyway, yeah. anyway um, but most were obviously Australian residents and 77.5% also had private health insurance. Those who didn't, two thirds of them actually put it down to cost, but there were really interesting reasons that came through in their comments, included that um, affordability <laughs> top value for money, 51% just didn't think they saw the value for money in private health care, they were disillusioned about pocket and gap fees, a third of people said that, um, Medicare was sufficient, a third of people said that, um, and, and others were just frustrated at the thought of having to pay a Medicare surcharge as well as a private premium. So 59% um, had children, 13.5% were carers, if you excluded um, the, the dependents. And we actually had quite a few male carers in the mix as well. So it was something about who was attracted um, to pick up and do this survey. Um, so family income, I just jumped ahead. You can see here that they're actually biased towards um, the right. So we actually have quite an affluent sample here. We do have people from all income groups, males are more spread, females being a bit older, are also more likely um, to have a higher income with that middle group being the, the most common um, group that women fell in. We also looked at oh, not a slide with this bad, um, education by uh, gender and again same story, highly educated, particularly the women. A lot of postgraduate women in this group. So just bear in mind, this isn't going to be, the proportions might be uh, relevant to the general population. And finally, household size by gender. Women tend to be in smaller households, either you know single or with um, a partner. This is the most common situation. Males more likely to be um, spread across household size. We also wanted, rather than just looking at income, an understanding of in a typical month, how difficult it might be for our participants to cover their expenses and pay all their bills. And you can see it was similar for males or females. We met for a lot. There was no or only slight, um, oh, sorry, I'm... sorry. <laughs> so looking at health. So the health profile of the group, this is self-rated health, was um, the most common description was very good, um, regardless of gender. But we also had quite a high rate of very uh, of excellent or good. So in fact, it had a quite a healthy profile, this group that we were talking to. This is just looking at how they self-rated health according to their age group. Relatively um, low numbers reported having um, excellent health. Interestingly, in the 18 to 25 year olds, as well as the 76 to 85 year olds, 
Whereas we have people in those middle adult years who are describing their health protection. But the majority sort of peaked around the very good um, in terms of common answers, um, except a push to the right for old people, not surprising. Um, but still rating their health more commonly as good than anything else. No one rated their health as poor in this survey, so we haven't captured that group. And here we're looking at self-rated health again, but according to their difficulty in covering expenses. So the group on the left had no difficulty paying their bills on a monthly basis, some moderate, and then those who had a lot of difficulty on the right. But you can see the similar pattern around most people. Sorry. Um, but we had um, the proportion who reported excellent health diminished a bit going from no financial difficulties to some up to moderate. We had small numbers in the, in the other groups. So this is now looking at health service access in the last 12 months. 55% reported skipping at least one or more appointments or service um, access in that 12 month period. So I've summarized it in this table to show that the most commonly skipped service was um, doctor with nearly a third of people reporting that they hadn't attended the doctor. So when they said there was a need, but they haven't actually followed through and got there. And the leading um, reason was actually they said they themselves were busy. They had other commitments they couldn't fit it in. But that might be tied to the availability of the doctor as well. That was the second most common reason that they couldn't actually find a doctor to access. But it might also be those two things working together. There's limited access. You've got limited time in trying to make those things connect contributes to that being the most commonly missed appointment. Dentist was next. Here, financial reasons became more dominant. Um, nervousness, also dominant. And I wonder with both doctors and dentists, the doctors in this case, whether the COVID period actually changed the way people think about going to clinics. So it might not be nervousness about the appointment or about the diagnosis. It might be about being around other people and the risk. COVID. But dentists, we know there's a nervousness associated with dentists in any way. That continues um, to be a driver. And a few in each case said unnecessary, or they had other reasons that were quite specific. About a fifth have not followed through on getting their pathology tests completed or some other um, test or treatment. And then we have scripts down the bottom. It was less than 10 percent. And most Put that down to financial reasons or they were busy and didn't get around to it but at the same time it's a small portion of the sample that hadn't actually followed through on those so now if we look at the medicare news and this is just gathering information about um, how medicare itself made a difference or not to the way people sought healthcare access. And for over a quarter of the group, it was always important. It was always part of this um, uh, going to see the doctor or filling a script or whatever. Um, most said, the most common answer was sometimes, so it's still part of their thinking. And then um, a third said, no, it doesn't come into it. Very few said they didn't know. Most people had an opinion on that. So if we look at this result, which is just looking at, again, people's ability to meet their bills, um, and then seeing whether or not Medicare plays a role in their decision making, unsurprisingly, the people that had the most trouble, we're going over here to the um, very difficult in, in getting their bills paid, they are more likely to you think about Medicare, 50% of them, Medicare is the main driver of their decision. So it's not surprising results, but it's interesting to see how it's captured, but that Medicare itself still remains important across all groups, regardless of their income situation or their financial stress. So these are some of the quotes. And I think we've heard this this morning about we can get healthcare without making 
the decision about whether it's utilities this week or health. So not having to make those awful decisions, particularly for uh, women with children. In this case, um, I seek it when it's needed as opposed to when it's only very serious, absolutely necessary and usually later. Both these people reported some financial difficulty. The first woman had kids and had some difficulty. The second, no children, but in a moderate financial um, crush <laughs> um, as she was writing this. 86% of people had used bulk bill service, bulk billing services um, who participated in the survey. And we're interested to know whether they actually knew what they were getting as part of that or whether it, it might be one of those things where if Medicare is covering it, they don't realise the difference it's making. About 50% said they were aware of the Medicare contribution. I was interested to see how many of these people got that information from my gov. And about 60% of them did. But there are another group who are accessing my gov for Medicare, but weren't translating that to understanding the costs that were being covered for Medicare. And obviously there's 50% people who just didn't, um, didn't understand. And it might be one of those areas where it might be helpful to help people understand the true costs of medicine if they understand then a bit more about how the system works for their benefit. We asked them a broad question there, open answer, just what comes to mind when you hear Medicare? And this is just the word all that captures some of the key things, a lot of it linked to government, but it was health, it was about free care, but other words were, were quite strongly represented, including safety net, um, universal health care, and security. Security was a, a recurring theme. So we also asked them what type of health system they preferred, just the big picture, how health systems are constructed. Most people actually said a um, hybrid system, combination of government and private. Um, but no, actually that was the second most popular. Nearly half actually said a wholly provided by government health service. Uh, that, was, that was interesting. And most people had a view. Then we came to the question of confidence. And this was um, important as Minister Hunt talked about it, how people see what they get through the Medicare system. So, the question was put that if you were to become seriously ill, how confident are you that you would get quality and safe medical care, the most effective medication, best medical technology, and be able to afford the care you need? And so, very through to not at all confident. Most people were confident to some degree. Overall, the most common response was somewhat confident, so a bit guarded. But when it came to Having quality and safe medical care, the most common answer though was very confident, 43% of people. But um, <coughs> it does drop away, and that's important to understand. And as you move away from the general medical care to the specifics, you start to see more people not being very confident. So we also asked or posed it, that Medicare is important to my sense of being Australians. This comes to the question Carolyn asked earlier as well, and the Minister's comments. And it was interesting because most people agree, or strongly agreed, that it actually did come to that very core sense of what it is to be Australian. Fortunately, not that many disagreed, but some did, and, uh, and disagreed quite Categorically, we didn't have anyone who strongly disagreed. It was interesting that these, there was no association between gender and how people reported or their self reported health, or even if they had to wait for a doctor, couldn't get to see a doctor when they wanted to. They still had the same pattern with the majority of people during the impact statement or for testing you know, neutral. But the people under financial stress were more likely to answer in a more positive way. So that was the trend that we saw. We then um, gave them the option to actually provide their own quotes and put it in their own words. So I pulled out some here that capture some of this. I'll just put through while I'm here. 
So very true and proud of it. People saw this as being fundamentally Australian. One person just said, freedom God. It's a call to our belief that we are a fair and healthy nation. Yes, it's a call to me. This was interesting to me. I have more affinity for my Medicare card than my passport or my license. So someone who's newly uh, become a citizen, 2020, actually saw this as something they were proud of. It was social achievement. It was about the community in which they lived. So that to me was quite interesting. It sort of went beyond the question of what it is to be Australian. It was kind of unmet. But there were other people where it didn't have that same resonance. I don't associate Medicare with nationality, not really, because it doesn't compete with the NHS um, and the Brits. <clears throat> and this was interesting. A person who said, I don't associate it with being Australian. It's a more fundamental human right. Mm. So that yeah, we should all have it. That's a given. It doesn't make me being proud to be Australian, though it's probably part of their picture about human rights in Australia. So we then went on and posed three uh, statements to them to see which one they most closely aligned with. The first was that the system works pretty well and only needs minor tweaks. The second one was that uh, there are some good things, but it needs some pretty serious work, fundamental changes. And the third was that it should be thrown out and we need to start again, essentially. So this is how the responses played out. The majority thought that there were some good things, but it did need some fundamental work. It wasn't far off the people who thought it was actually pretty good and they needed money. So that could well depend on their experience of the system. And we've heard about a lot of the changes that are afoot and they wouldn't have been public knowledge at the time people were filming this survey. <laughs> we also asked them a few words, what beliefs or ideas they associate with Medicare. And again, a similar story. So we're coming at this from slightly different angles, different points in the survey. And they talked again about you know, health overall, universal health, but also equity, care, access, people, um, and we broke that down a little bit and we pulled out the ones that we saw as just completely positive. Those are a bit more qualified, but mainly positive and so on. And you can see that the majority response was overall positive. We posed that to them, so interpreting their words. Only very few people, only four in this sample, only had negative things to say. Again, that was a similar pattern by gender, whether you pay kids or not, their own um, self-assessed health, as well as the financial stress they're under. The younger they were, the more positive they were actually, which was quite interesting. It was a slight shift there, but not statistically significant. If they hadn't been able to access a doctor when they wanted to, they were also still quite positive, but crept a bit more into the negative results. So, but there were, there were small numbers. So we also asked them in a few words to describe what Medicare meant to them personally. And we broke those results down into very pragmatic or literal answers through to things that were much more um, big picture, um, expansive values, rights, statements. And oops. And so here, it was difficult. This, I must say, was one of the most difficult coding challenges because a lot of people did all of these things or a couple of them. So it's a little bit sort of forced into the boxes, but it was pretty spread across the board. And there were probably more people that threw in something that was a general statement about um, rights and equity. We also um, captured some of those quotes to give you an idea. It was people talking about their own personal experience, a sort of pragmatic response to that question. They're being able to afford the treatment they needed provides a sense of safety. Um, people talk about if I don't need it now, I might need it in future. So then it became more expensive because I was talking more generally about risk. And if I don't need it now, but someone else does, that's a good thing, that, that could be me tomorrow. But others thought it was outdated, not reflected of current medical practice. Um, Personalised, that was more their, their own stories and narratives. Here we had someone who's sister had a two year wait to get um, 
the treatment she needed. Others talk about generally how important it is in their family and their family's health and not having to lose your savings. Again, hearing about, you know, what changed with the introduction of Medicare in the first place, that thing about security, not just health, but also financial. <clears throat> and here's someone else who, they, due to their age, and they're actually 55 or 65, so very good to hear. She said, due to my age, generally good health, I don't really think much about Medicare, but I guess I might think about it more often. Yeah. As that need. Uh, and we also looked at it in terms of the language they're using around equity, security, social democracy, and rights. And again, it was about equity. That's the first thing that came through, closely followed by that security, both individual and government wise. But again, mixed comments. There were people who talked about the principle of universal health care being important to them, um, but they don't see Medicare as providing that as it currently stands. Someone else wrote about valuing that it's freely available, all members of community have access, good health being vitally important and so on, but it doesn't always work. So again, it comes back to that need for refinement and improvement. And then very positive statements included things like this, Med um, Medicare, means the world to me it means that australians can get the care they need and that view that you know it's there for others it's not just for me and people understanding that and that it's part of a functioning social democracy so to wrap that up it was um fascinating to read their comments but it was what really struck us as a group of researchers was the evidence of this broad based general positivity enthusiasm for the system that wasn't tied to someone's socioeconomic status or education directly. So strong evidence of support both personal and societal, but also the importance of equity in health service access and human rights coming through over and over. The personal and societal meaning of Medicare was remarkably consistent as I say, Although we have to bear in mind that this was a, a sample that doesn't in proportions represent what's happening in the population. We still have the breadth of coverage and the fact that we had enough people in lower income or under income stress who were saying similar things just makes us want to go out and ask more people to <laughs> get that representative sample and see if this is true. Because I think this is really important for us to understand. Cost of private healthcare and gap payments still remain sore points. Um, but to remember the cost of living pressures will be greater now than the time this survey was done. And there is that overlay of COVID, some of it quite intense around the 20, early 22 timing in terms of people's access to healthcare. A lot of the questions reflected over the previous 12 months, which was the Delta outbreak, and that did impact um, in so many ways in uh, the eastern part of the country with lockdowns as well, but also the lingering effects, as the minister talked about, people's attitudes to health. So really interesting insights, more questions and answers as comes from the next research, but um, something we're hoping we can go on with now that we've developed this tool, trialed it, and, and had a glimpse at, at what people are thinking and, and looking at this in a different time point will be interesting as well. So thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. So we've got about five minutes for questions before we go to morning tea. Yes. Please identify yourself as well. Hi, um, I'm James. I'm the senior advisor at the National Association of People Living in HIV Australia, so NAPWA. Um, my question is about the policy and political implications of your research. So you asked a question about um, the importance of Medicare to people's identities as Australians. And my question is, um, how important do you think that kind of association to Medicare is to um, political choices, so voting. Um, so the, the example that you brought up and um, it was brought up in the last speech was NHS and uh, the UK being really important to the national identity, but then that maybe not reflecting the last three elections um, and people's choices when it comes to the leaders and um, healthcare. Well, I, I think that's a great question. I also think we've heard the minister reflect on this this morning because 
Carolyn you know, was also getting at that same point. You know, it's often not the question that's asked of people. And so actually having even this information at this point is, I think, really useful because it is about um, uh, recognising that it's more than a, a health system per se, that it, it's part of our fabric. And I do think that came through very strongly, that there was people's sense of, as I said, rating a Medicare card over the passport. You know, what does DFAT think about? But, but it's actually really important because that's something that people are coming to Australia for or seeing as, you know, what, what they want to see in Australia in a social democracy. So I, I think it's really important. I'm going to invite Carolyn to say something. Yeah, well. um, it, yeah it's interesting what you're saying about the NHS. So it seems from, from the, um, the reading I've done that it's similar to Anzac in Australia. There was a grassroots revive um, sense of commemorating the NHS under Thatcher, sort of fight back against Thatcher in the 80s. And then the 90s, New Labour really jumped on board um, with state-driven commemoration of the NHS. And then those conservative governments have continued it even while they were removing all that funding from it and cutting it in other ways. So it, it can be a dangerous thing as well because it's like Anzac in Australia, all politicians jump on that bandwagon because it's so popular. So um, in the UK, you get the Conservatives can quite happily um, get political mileage out of the NHS at the same time as, as sort of remove, um, diminishing it. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I think another potential difference is and I was struck by this during COVID, that the NHS um, is very linked to the healthcare workers. And so, you know, nurses be applauded and they'd be part of the NHS and part of this sort of country commitment. I don't think that's quite the same here. I don't think people see a GP and think that's Medicare personified, <laughs> you know. And I do think there's been a lot of public debate, you know, whether it's pharmacists mm -hmm. or GPs or others, you know, when they're looking at some of these changes to Medicare. So it's not presented in the same way. And that's right that there are those discussions as well and it's got to work for all of the system won't work but it probably starts to break down some of those things that you know that those hero nurses in, in the UK during COVID were NHS you know um embodied thank you thank, thank you yeah for various reasons most people in Australia like Medicare whereas in the US they generally oppose universal health care. What do you think are the fundamental drivers which are causing these differences? Look, I, you're now speaking to a scientist. Um, <laughs> it was a very big social question, but my my view, thinking about this as as a health, you know, public health person, is that um, there's a fundamental difference in the US when it comes to social democracy. Uh, it's it's you know having talked to a lot of colleagues who work there in public health. The difficulty in actually gaining support, you know, even to have when we saw what happened with um, Obama, you know, in getting the Medicaid in place and trying to have um, equity in healthcare access. But it's across the board. So I think it's so fundamentally different trying to situate a socially democratic and equitable health system in that mindset is a real challenge for them. So I think, you know, we've seen it play out. And we've seen how that's also been rolled back in terms of what they did manage to achieve. So I, I do think it's how it sits more broadly. And I think that's where this is quite interesting that people were associating with their politics, but not so clearly that, you know, there would be people in there who, who would vote for all parties. <laughs> but, you know, we didn't, the, the messaging was quite clear. It seemed to be apolitical here. But I think that could be different when you're in a country with a strong individual rights kind of constitution underpinning it. Oh, well, this is the last question, sorry. <clears throat> Thank, Thank you, Caroline. Hi, Nicole Bacalami. I um, wear a few different hats. I'm CEO at CoHealth, a community health organisation in Victoria. I'm also a dental practitioner and sit on the board of uh, Dental Health Services Victoria, which is our lead public oral health agency in the state. And my question is dental related. So mm. I'm um, you know, really interested in the potential expansion of Medicare to put the mouth back in the body, to include um, oral health for all Australians as part of uh, Medicare with there any feedback from the survey? Just thinking about the question about, you know, people not going to see the dentist. It didn't come through like in there, the... You know, why isn't dental in oh, Medicare or we need to expand Medicare to include dental services? Yeah, or by the time it is in Medicare, it's too late because you've got very severe problems right. when you're hospitalised. Yes. 
Um, they didn't talk about it specifically, but we we know that there's very much a um, an income based yeah. divide between right. who has preventative treatment versus who has early treatment versus who succumbs, and then it's relying on the public system. So um, oral health and public health is a yeah. is a big issue, and so we're very aware of that. But yeah, that didn't come through here. But I think that's something because it was the second most common thing that was skipped, where people that's knew right. they should be going, yeah. and that's probably not thinking. I'm due for a checkup. It's more likely to be yeah. I've got a pain and not attending. Those numbers, I think, help drive some of that. And that's again one of the things we'd be very interested in pursuing this work. If anyone's got a pocket full of money that they want to help us <laughs> with this research, because I do think there's all these unanswered questions. And now is the time as we're going through these reforms to think about all these options. All right, we better finish there. Captain's got to dash off. Thank you very much, Catherine. And please come and join us.